Good morning. It's great to be here. It's kind of like coming home, a little bit like coming home, because I'm a Talbot grad. I have an MDiv and a THM from Talbot. Um, I did my undergraduate someplace else at a rival, I won't mention. But my brother is a graduate of Biola. In fact, he was president of S, uh, Student Missionary Union, SMU. Is that what that's, that's called? Yeah. Probably 150 years ago, I think that was actually about 30 years ago. And my son Daniel is a junior here at Biola and very proud of him. And then my niece Rebecca is also here as well. So we have tons of Biola connections. And then of course, Matt inviting me. I so appreciated him inviting me to come here and speak. Matt's the greatest professor in the world as I know you all know that. So it's great to be here. And we're looking at the parables of Jesus and one of perhaps the most famous parables of Jesus. Do you guys ever lose anything? Do you lose things a lot? Let me ask you, how many of you have lost a cell phone in the last two years? Raise your hand, look at this, this is amazing. How many have lost cell phones? I read recently that seven million dollars of cell phones are lost every single day in America, every single day. And growing up as a kid, I was a constant loser of things. I would lose things constantly. It drove my parents crazy. I'd lose about a jacket every week two or three wallets a year. I'd go off to camp with a suitcase full of clothes and come home with one half empty. I once lost a wallet. 15 years later, some friends called me. They were selling a car that they had, cleaning it out, and they found that wallet underneath the seat. It was so great. It had my first license in it from the 70s. You know, I had hair down to here. I had hair, that was a great thing. But the, the thing about being a chronic loser is there's great sorrow in losing things, but there's even greater joy because you keep finding things. It's wonderful. But what's worse than losing something is being lost yourself. I read a great story by James Moore. It's in a book. His book, this book has got a great title. It's called, Yes, Lord, I Have Sinned, But I Have Some Excellent Excuses. He says, when I was seven, I got lost at Ringling Brothers Circus. More than 20,000 people were there that night. My older brother, Bob, who was nine, had taken me by the hand down one of the exit ramps from the arena of the crowded concession stand to get some cotton candy. There were no neat lines. People were pushing and pressing towards the counter, trying to get the vendor's attention. Since my brother was taller, he went first, and then he meant to wait for me. But just then, loud laughter came from the arena, followed by thunderous applause and fireworks. The ringmaster's voice exploded over the public address system, introducing the clowns, the main act we wanted to see. My brother didn't mean to leave me, but the excitement was too much. He wanted to see the clouds, clowns, so he ran up the ramp. He meant to wait for me there, but a policeman told him he couldn't stand there and asked to see his ticket stub. When Bob fished out his ticket stub, he fished out two, mine and his, so the policeman escorted him to his seat. By this time, I had my cotton candy, and I looked toward the spot where my brother had been standing only moments before. But now he was gone, and I felt sick in the, deep down in the pit of my stomach. I was scared to death. I was all alone in that huge crowd. I didn't know which ramp to go up. I didn't know which section our seats were in. All the ramps looked the same. I couldn't find my ticket stub. Worse, off, worse of all, I had lost my appetite for cotton candy. Terrified now, I went up the wrong ramp. When I entered the auditorium, I turned the wrong way. Nothing looked familiar. I wondered if I would ever see my family again. I started to run, trying to fight back tears. Panic-stricken, I looked frantically for a familiar sign or friendly face. But all eyes were riveted on the stage. Everyone was laughing loudly at the antics of the clowns. They weren't funny to me at that moment. I remember thinking, how can they laugh? How can they laugh at a time like this when I feel so lost? Just then, I felt a touch on my shoulder. I turned around to be gathered into the strong, loving arms. It was my dad. My father had come after me and had found me. It was a good thing he did because I was running as fast as I possibly could in the wrong direction. He held me, calmed me, reassured me. Then he took me downstairs and bought me a Coke and a hot dog and a yo-yo and a lizard and a little stuffed bear and a candied apple. I learned a valuable lesson that day. Being lost is terrible, but being found is wonderful. Did you know that the Bible has a chapter of lost and found stories? If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 15. 
These are God's lost and found stories, and they fit beautifully into the narrative of Luke's gospel, where the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The first story in chapter 15 is the story of a shepherd who has 100 sheep and loses one of them. So he leaves all 99 to find that lost sheep. The second story is a woman is the story of a woman who has 10 coins. She loses one of these valuable coins and she turns the house upside down until she finds it. Then she invites her friends for a joyful party because what was lost has been found. In both of those stories, the message is the same. The message is that losing something precious causes extraordinary pain. But finding it again brings great joy. Both stories are about God and about us. When one of his children wanders away for a time, he longs to have them back. He experiences great pain. But when they return to him, he has great joy. The third story is perhaps the most famous parable Jesus ever told. The story of the lost son, or as we know it, the story of the prodigal son. It teaches us a great deal about who we are as God's people and who God is as our Father. But this is not just a parable, it's also an allegory. An allegory means that each of the characters represents something in Jesus' ministry. The Father in the parable represents God and his agent, Jesus Christ, who is seeking and saving the lost. The younger son who takes his inheritance and leaves represents the sinners and tax collectors, the people that Jesus is ministering to. And the older son represents the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders who are rejecting Jesus' ministry to the lost. But in another sense, this parable is not just about them, it's about us. And each of us at various points fulfills the role of one of those individuals in the parables. We're prodigals who wander off away from God. We are seeking and saving the lost, bringing them back to him. Or like the older brother, we're rejecting God's purpose and plan to reach out to those who've never heard the message. I'm going to focus on the actions of each of the three key individuals here this morning. The actions, first of all, of the younger son. In verse 12, the younger son come and comes and he demands his share of the inheritance. He demands his share of the inheritance. Now, this is shocking. It's shocking for two, two reasons. First of all, it's shocking that the son would ask for his share of the inheritance. Respect for elders was a major, a huge value in that culture, much greater than in ours. To ask for your inheritance is like saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. You've got to understand, he's not just asking to borrow some money to go to Europe for the summer. That's what I did, by the way. When I graduated from college, I announced to my parents I wanted to go to Europe. I wanted to travel around on Eurail passes and stay in youth hostels. At first they were skeptical, but then they encouraged me. Seems I lost a lot of clothes on that trip, if I remember. But what if I said to my parents, what I'd like you to do, I'd like you to sell your house, cash in the money, and buy a yacht so that I can cruise the Mediterranean. That's sort of what he's saying, cash in your inheritance, cash in what you're gonna retire on and give it to me. What prompted the son to do this? I think he, like all of us, had a nagging need for independence. He wanted to be on his own, to to do what he wanted, free of responsibilities. I read a great little story about a two-year-old named Frankie Frankie had a real rebellious streak about him. And one day, his mother saw Frankie. She walked into the living room and saw Frankie grabbing a chair and dragging it across the living room. And then he poked it under the curtains, which were closed, and he climbed up, and his two little legs were protruding out under the curtains. So she wondered what in the world was going on. She snuck up behind Frankie and heard him say in a small, squeaky voice, I've got to get out of here. Do you ever feel like that? Like you just need to get away, get away from your problems. Maybe your parents are driving you crazy or your roommate is driving you crazy. Maybe school is boring, you're getting annoyed by people around you, you just wanna get away. I have to say, I still, I've still felt that way sometimes. There've been times I've gotten into my car at Bethel Seminary where I teach and I've started to head east to our home in El Cajon and I thought, 
what would happen if I just kept going, you know? El Cajon, Alpine, Phoenix, El Centro, Phoenix, Bangladesh, you know, just keep going, leave it all behind. Leave those responsibilities behind. Some years ago, I got home from work after a hard day of work, and my kids were young at the time, and I was teaching several nights a week. My wife was kind of going crazy at the time. She met me at the door. As I'm coming in, she must have seen me arrive. She met me at the door, and she said to me, I'm going out, feed them, bathe them, put them to bed. I might be back, she said. (laughs) And she had this wild look in her eyes. I don't know if I'd call it insanity. No, I think I would call it insanity. Those eyes said, if I have to stay in this house one more minute with these little minions of Satan, I cannot be responsible for my actions. Then bam, the door closed, she was gone. I'm still standing there with my briefcase like, so how was your day? Do you ever feel that way? You just want to get away. That must have been how the son was feeling. He wants to get away, away from the responsibilities, from the expectations, to do what he wants to do. So he tells his father, I'm out of here. He takes his inheritance money and heads off looking for adventure. Now, in that culture, it's shocking the son would ask for his inheritance, but it's equally shocking that the father would give it to him. This is not the age of the permissive parent. Fathers were absolute authorities in their home. We expect them to say, you want your what? You want your inheritance? Listen, you impudent little twit. You'll get your inheritance when I'm good and ready. Get back out in that field and get to work or you'll lose it all. That's what we expect. Or as Bill Cosby said in one of his parenting sketches, I brought you into the world and I can take you out of the world. That's what we expect the father to say, but the father doesn't respond that way. Instead, he loves his son and wants to to do the best for him, to give him a chance to pursue his dreams. So he gives him the inheritance and sends him off. Things go well at first. He buys all the, the, the things he's always wanted to do. He's got friends crowding around him to spend it. But in time, the money runs out. Verse 13 Luke 15 says he squandered his wealth in in wild living. And just as the money is running out, the economy turns bad. Verse 14, after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country. He began to be in need. Jobs are scarce, and those friends that helped him spend the money are nowhere to be found. So finally, he finds a job, the worst possible job. He gets a job feeding pigs, verse 15. He hired himself out to someone who sent him out to feed pigs. Now remember the context. This is a good Jewish boy. Pigs are unclean animals. What's the worst job you've ever had? Fast food maybe. You ever seen that show Dirty Jobs? Think of the worst job, you know? Cleaning sewers under the city. Scraping an inch of grease off the fryer walls. This is, for this guy, this is the worst possible job job. He doesn't even make enough to survive. He longs to eat the pig's food until finally he's had enough. In verse 17, we learn when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. And as he reflected on his past life, he realized everything he wanted now he had had in his father's household. Everything he longed for now, he had already had. Remember, when I first went off to college, I went over to San Diego State for two years. I moved in with a roommate. It was so great to have my freedom to do what I want. Then I realized that freedom meant eating Kraft macaroni and cheese five nights a week and top ramen on weekends. You ever do that? That's the It meant freedom to pay my rent, freedom to do my own laundry, Freedom to get a job. And it dawned on me how much my parents have done. You need to call your parents and thank them this afternoon, right? For all that they did for you. So I started slipping home on weekends, you know, just to pick up stuff I'd forgotten. I'd usually arrive right around dinner time. (laughs) Oh, dinner. Oh, I didn't even look at the time. Can I stay? Of course I'll stay. What's that on my shoulder? Oh, I was heading to the laundromat at this moment. Oh, you'll do the laundry? Great, Mom. You know, I wasn't expecting that at all. Don't, 
You do it, right? You all do it, I know you do. But we get that way with God. He's so confining, all those rules. He wants to spend time with him to pray, to read our Bibles, and sometimes we just want to do what we want to do. But what happens when we go without God, when we drift away from him? It's like spiritual top ramen, isn't it? Five days a week. Because only with our Father will we find true joy, true abundant life, true peace. Only in relationship with him. So the son makes a decision. He'll return and accept the consequences of his actions. No longer as a son. He's lost the inheritance, but as a slave. In spiritual terms, he repents. But how will the father receive him? Will he reject him? Will he turn him away? We've seen the characteristics of the younger son. Let's look at the characteristics of the father. Verse 20, verse 20 of Luke 15. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And he turned his back on him and said, look who came crawling back. If you think you're gonna get one more penny from me in the future, you've got another thing coming. I'm sorry, is that what your Bible says? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was reading from the NLV. That is the new legalist version of the Bible. Let me read it instead in the NIV, okay? But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. A couple of things culturally I want you to see in this passage. First of all, his father sees him far off, far away. What does that tell us about the father? What is he doing? Every day he's out there. This is not expected of a patriarch. People come to the patriarch, he doesn't go to them. But he sees him far off because he's looking, he's longing. There's a picture of God. God is never too busy. He's always looking, he's always longing for his children to, to come back to him. The second cultural thing I want you to see is his father runs to the son. You may have heard this before, but running, the patriarch of the family would never run. Running was for children and for slaves. This is astonishing behavior. It would be viewed as shameful behavior. The father, the patriarch was the most dignified member of the household. He would never do this. What's the point? The point is he doesn't care about dignity. This is unbridled joy, joy that throws off all constraints. Reminds me of David. Do you remember King David bringing the ark into Jerusalem where he danced before the Lord with all his might? His wife, Michal, said, how could you embarrass yourself like that? And David basically says, I will embarrass myself before the Lord I love any time. I'll make a fool of myself to show how much I love him. That's what the father is saying. Hey, I will make a fool of myself any day to demonstrate my love for the son. I read a profound insight about this story. Do you know what the word prodigal means? We call this story the prodigal son. Prodigal means wasteful, spendthrift, extravagant, extravagant, lavish to a fault. Someone has said this is not just the parable of the prodigal son, it's the parable of the prodigal father. Because this is extravagant, this is lavish, this is, this is overwhelming, this is shocking love, showing this kind of loving kindness to his, to his son. The son starts into his speech in verse 21. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said, you know, you're right, you need to go slop some pigs. No, sorry, that's the NLV once again, the new legalist version. Let me read it again. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. What does he do? He offers unqualified forgiveness. He not only forgives him though, he gives him back even more, an overwhelming gift. What do each of these things symbolize? Notice what he says. He says, bring, bring the best robe in the house. Who would own, in a context like this, who would own the best robe in the house? The father, right? The patriarch. So bring the patriarch's robe, the robe of dignity. He says, we're gonna have a feast. Kill the fattened calf. 
Anyone grown up, uh, raised on a farm here? A calf, this is a big animal. Cultural specialists tell us that this animal would be only sacrificed for a, for a major celebration, like a wedding feast or a visiting dignitary. This is shocking behavior. His son, who's wasted all the money, comes home and he treats him like a visiting king. Come on, put the kid on probation. Make him feel guilty for a while, right? That's what we do to our kids. Let him earn his way back. But you see, what's the point of the parable? That's not the nature of God's grace. God's grace is extravagant. It is lavish. It is overwhelming. It is downright prodigal. But there's another character we have to mention. And this character in the story is not happy with the younger son coming back. You know who that character is? It's the fatted calf. That's who it is. He's not happy at all. No, I'm joking. It's, of course, the older brother. He's angry and refuses to rejoice when the lost is found. Verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. The older brother basically says he, asked, he has to earn his way back in the family. That's what I've done. I've earned my way into the family. You see, the older son represents those religious leaders in Jesus' ministry who didn't need God's call for repentance because they had done nothing wrong, who believed they had earned their way into God's favor. But what's the problem with that? The problem is no one can earn their way into God's favor. I read the story of a pastor who was preaching on this passage. And just when he finished up, a man came forward, a man who was visiting the first time. He came forward and he was red in the face. He could barely control his anger. He said, you're making a fool of God. That boy has to pay for what he did. He has to earn his way back into the family. That guy must have been reading from the NLV, the new legalist version. Because the point is, none of us can earn our way back. Isaiah 53 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the sin of us all. The Bible says we're like sheep who've gone astray. We need to humbly come back to God and say, we are not worthy of your grace, of your favor. And what, do we, what does he do when we come back like that? He lifts us up, and he says, welcome home, my child. Welcome home, my son. Some of you right now might be feeling a little bit like the prodigal. Maybe you've drifted away from God. Maybe you've been in trouble with your parents, broken relationships, struggling. Maybe you're fighting all the time with some friends. Maybe you're getting into stuff you shouldn't be getting into. Maybe drinking too much, getting into pornography. Let me tell you, all that stuff will leave you empty. Ultimately, it's like spiritual top ramen. Maybe you're just drifting away from God, becoming complacent in your spiritual life. But whatever has caused you to drift away, put that behind you, come back. This story reminds us that God is always waiting, always looking, always open arms, waiting for you to return. Not just that, he's always on the road, scanning the horizon. And when he sees you, he drops all dignity and runs to greet you and embraces you and said, my child, welcome home. Let's throw a party, the biggest bash we can. So you may have heard Philip Yancey's retelling of the story of the prodigal son in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace? I just want to close by reading parts of this story from Yancey's book. A young girl grows up on a cherry orchard just above Traverse City, Michigan. Her parents, a bit old-fashioned, tend to overreact to her nose ring, the music she listens to, and the length of her skirts. They ground her a few times, and she seethes inside. I hate you, she screams at her father when he knocks on the door of her room after an argument. And that night, she acts on a plan she has mentally rehearsed scores of times. She runs away. 
She's visited Detroit only once before. It will be the last place her parents will look for her. California, maybe, or Florida, but not Detroit. Her second day there, she meets a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen. He offers her a ride, buys her lunch, arranges a place for her to stay. He gives her some pills that make her feel better than she's ever felt before. She was right all along, she decides. Her parents were keeping her from all the fun. The good life continues for a month, two months, a year. The man with the big car teaches her a few things that men like. She lives in a penthouse and orders room service whenever she wants. Occasionally, she thinks about the folks back home, but their lives now seem so boring, so provincial, she can hardly believe she grew up there. But after a year, the first signs of illness appear, and it amazes her how fast the boss turns mean. Before she knows it, she's out on the street without a penny to her name. She still turns a couple of tricks a night, but they don't pay much, and all the money goes to support her habit. One night as she lies awake in despair, all of a sudden, everything about her life looks different. She no longer feels like a woman of the world. She feels like a little girl, lost in a cold and frightening city. God, why did I leave, she says to herself. My dog back home eats better than I do. She's sobbing, and she knows in a flash that more than anything else in the world, she wants to go home. Three straight phone calls, three straight connections with the answering machine. She hangs up without leaving a message the first two times, but the third time she says, Dad, Mom, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way. It'll get there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, well, I guess I'll just stay on the bus until it hits Canada. It takes about seven hours for a bus to make all the stops between Detroit and Traverse City. And during that time, she realizes the flaws in her plan. What if her parents are out of town and miss the message? Even if they're home, they'll probably wrote her off as dead long ago. When the bus finally rolls into the station, the driver announces in a crackly voice over the microphone, 15 minutes, folks. She walks into the terminal, not knowing what to expect, and not one of the thousand scenes that have played out in her mind prepare her for what she sees. There in the concrete walls and plastic chairs bus terminal in Traverse City, Michigan, stands a group of 40 brothers and sisters and great aunts and uncles and cousins and a grandmother and a great grandmother to boot. They're all wearing ridiculous looking party hats and blowing noisemakers. And taped across the entire wall of the terminal is a computer generated banner that reads, Welcome Home. Out of the crowd, a well wishers breaks her dad. She looks through tears and begins the memorized speech. Dad, I'm sorry, I know. He interrupts her. Hush, child, we've got no time for that. No time for apologies. You'll be late for your party. A banquet's waiting for you at home. Extravagant? Absolutely. Undeserved? You better believe it. But it's just like God. Always reaching out, always ready for our return. I guess the question becomes, who are, what character we're gonna play? Many of us have played the prodigal. It's time to come home. Um, many of us have played the older brother, where in some way we reject God's ministry. We look down on others who we consider to be sinners and outcasts instead of loving them. It's time to play the, the role of Jesus in this parable. It's time to reach out to others and offer them the amazing gift of grace that God has given us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That's the message of Luke's gospel. That's the message of the Bible, that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's carry on that passion, shall we? Close your eyes with me as we close our time together. Father, I pray that we would recognize and acknowledge that all we like sheep have gone astray, that we are sinners saved solely by your grace. And Lord, we can get an attitude that once we've been rescued, once we're in the rescue boat, we don't care about those who are drowning. But Lord, you came in the person of your son to seek and to save the lost. So I pray that that would be our passion, that would be our joy, and, and that would be our mission in life. Lord, to return to you ourselves and then to bring others along. 
Lord, I thank you for this university that has a passion to know you and to make you known. And I pray that we would continue to take this gospel message to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a good day. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.